Um, thanks for being here today. I cannot tell you how delighted I am to be here. I was here right before in January of, um, yes, so right before we all hid. And <laughs> so it's just, just a, I really have no words. This is, this is a special place for me and I've been um, always amazed at the um, sort of effervescence of this place, the liveliness, the, of, of course, uh, Rashmi and all of you, and the sort of interest, genuine interest for advancing scholarship, questioning scholarship. I think this is one of the strongest aspects of this kind of venue. It's this encouragement to always question, move forward, present newest research, which is um, per se not, not, you know, not fully uh, uh, kind of accomplished yet. And so this, this idea that we always walk on this path and um, and and Yamprava really uh, here uh, sort of fosters this kind of curiosity and encourages scholars actually to move forward to sort of think differently really. Um, so um, I am going to start uh, with the um, Canary Caves today. I mean I I didn't need a map really because you know, we all know where the Canary Caves are, but I thought for since there are some, we have online audience, maybe a good idea to locate ourselves physically. And um, I imagine all of you are familiar with the site. Um, as Rashmi was saying, is one of the really largest cave, uh, Buddhist cave uh, sites, Buddhist monasteries carved in a living rock in the Western Deccan. There are over a hundred caves and is the one that has a sort of a longest lifespan. We have inscriptions actually that document extended activity throughout the centuries. So in the end is one of the most, uh, I would say relevant sites within the uh, series of Buddhist cave temples um, in the region in the state of Maharashtra, yet is one that has not attracted a large amount of scholarship. Most recently, of course, that is Dr. Suraj Pandit, who has done incredible work on these caves. Um, but sort of other than that, the caves have been kind of asleep for a long time. So today I, and in, in, I plan to kind of bring you back to the site and to think about the later phases of activity at the site. We are very often concerned with the beginnings. You know, when does it start? When is a site established? When do we have the first occupation, the first caves? And so there is a lot of, um, you know, scholarship on that. Um, but I've grown uh, more and more interested into the growth of the site in the later phases, after the fifth, sixth century, and um, what what happened ninth century. How did this cave site evolve? And actually, I think it grew in relevance and became one of the major. Uh, centers for Buddhist tantric practices, Buddhist um, esoteric traditions in South Asia. And of course, I mean, I'm just beginning to work on this, but I thought I would share some of my thoughts. So this is what Kaneri looks like. And again, um, these are just a couple of view, um, uh, views. And we are looking at the um, name. OK. Oh, great. So one thing about the caves at Caneri that is quite shocking is that we do not have site plan. There's not, never been done a plan of the site. I mean, it's a site that is actually quite accessible today. We don't have to climb huge mountains in the city, actually. Yet, there is no plan of the site. Very few caves are being mapped. So it remains a virtually undocumented site. Um, so I hope that this can, you know, the future could be different and maybe at some point a project of, of plans um, for the cave site could be developed. So this is what we have right now. I mean, this is really um, kind of a minor, uh, yet a significant effort on, on sort of positioning the caves onto this hill, which is a hill um, of black basalt, which is where the name of the site Krishnagiri probably came from, the Black Mountain. So you can see that the caves are, we're looking at sort of over 100 caves. They are aligned on the side of these hills. And um, here are some of the uh, small caves. I mean, one of the features about Kaneri that is distinctive is that you don't have the 
monumental viharas of the Ajanta type, and we'll go back to that. We have a different kind of monastic dwelling that perhaps revealing of the particular nature of the site. So we are starting with the, um, we're jumping right to this uh, particular uh, moment of the life of the site. We are actually looking at this uh, late 5th century inscription that actually doesn't exist anymore um, that was found by Bird in a Buddhist stupa in the area before the Chaitya Hall number 3. So this is the area, of course, I'm not sure it was exactly in this particular stupa because the area has been cleared, but it must have been in one of these uh, small monuments that were erected in front of the main cave site. So I am not really going to talk about the phase of establishment of the caves. We are sort of skipping all the first, second, third century, and we're jumping right here. We're starting from this uh, cover plate inscriptions. The inscription mentioned the gift of a chaitya in stone and brick, likely the, one of the stupas here, at the Krishnagiri Mahavihara by a donor named Buddharuchi coming from the Sindhu, Sindhu Vishaya, or the part of Sindh, essentially. So what is interesting here, this is the very first epigraphic reference to the site as being a Mahavihara. So this is quite an interesting remark. We, of course, we do not find epigraphic evidence um, elsewhere referring to Mahavihara. Really, prior the fifth century, the Gupta period, we don't really have monasteries, as far as I know, referred to as Mahavihara. So it's it's, it's when this kind of terminology occurs in the epigraphic documentation. So um, it is a, um, remarkable also at this point that the donor who uh, donates this uh, monument comes all the way from Sindh, which is quite far away, about like maybe 900 kilometers, 1,000 kilometers. I have no idea, but clearly we are looking at sort of the long reach and of this monastery. Someone from Sindh felt it was the case to donate something here at the site. So I would say a, it seems like the uh, monastery um, had left the regional dimension to become a site of uh, relevance, trans-regional relevance. And also what is interesting is that the donor from Sindh may have probably come to Caneri via sea. So we have to imagine, probably the easiest way really to come from Sindh, I would think, um, in antiquity, we have to think about, uh, anyway, a maritime connection also for the movement of Buddhist, um, or the Buddhist tradition in Konkan. We always think about, you know, pilgrim and land routes and trade routes, but um, maritime Buddhism, or at least the maritime connection uh, within the Buddhist tradition is something that has been hardly explored. And I think this is a very important um, fact. Um, another interesting thing about the Sindhu, uh, the Sindh, the donor from Sindh, is uh, lately I was actually reading, rereading an article by Peter Skilling, who was talking about the Samitiya school of Buddhism. And he was, in fact, referring to the fact that this school may have been one of the most represented in Konkan, in this region. And that was one of the most represented Buddhist schools in Sindh as well. So what is interesting is that not only we have a kind of a connection in terms of sort of donors coming, but clearly there must have been, if indeed these schools were represented in both areas, quite a connection between the northern, uh, northwestern uh, Buddhism and Kaneri. So, We'll go back to this later on, but for a moment, I want to talk about what makes a Mahavihara a Mahavihara. I mean, I started to look um, at the um, origin of reuse of this term, and um, one of this German scholars, Gustav Roth, who really wrote an interesting book on, on all these terms, um, he was really looking at the Pali sources and, and saying that, you know, a, a great monastery is a big monastery. I mean, the Mahavihara is just a large monastery in the uh, sort of in the text, in the Buddhist text. Um, when we look at the later use of the word, especially the Chinese pilgrims make a lot of references to Mahaviharas. And these 
when they use that term, they seem to refer to large monastic settlement that had royal sponsorship in many cases. They had quite a number of infrastructures set up. So you would have maybe walls and you would have a kind of a water system and it was like a small town, a monastic town. And they were important educational centers with libraries and with an international kind of reputation. So this is what the tradition of Mahavihara seemed to have meant for these visitors, this Buddhist pilgrim who had come to India uh, after, of course, the fifth century. So looking precisely at this kind of chronological horizon. And when we look at the caves at Caneri, clearly we are looking at, a, at the monastic site that has a huge extension. I mean, this, this, it's quite a lot of land that's occupied. And we have to imagine that to sustain this large site, you had to have quite a lot of financial support, a significant amount of financial support and organization. This is something that we hardly think about, but uh, for every human aggregate and settlement, you need organization. You need, you need sort of um, figures who take charge of you know, administrative tasks. You need an infrastructure that makes the uh, site, the settlement work. What also you need is water, water collection and distribution that at the site is very well documented. We know there is a dam and we'll go look at it in a second. And in fact, um, the early evidence, uh, the, at least the early documentation of the site tells us even that there was a retaining wall, which we look at in the sort of in the up back of that huge hill, perhaps you can even look at it there, right behind here. Um, and then what really is remarkable at the Mahavihara, the great Vihara of Kaneri, is we have beginning shortly after the fifth century or the fifth century, this kind of colossal images, seven meters in height, carved right by either side of the Chaitya hole in the most public part of the site. So we are looking really at a great site, at a monumental site in its manifestation. So this is the only really real plan of the site that exists, where you have the orography of the hill, you have the caves marked, and I think uh, Shobana Gokhale uh, takes her kind of drawing from this particular map. But what's interesting here is that when it was done in the 19th century, um, the water system with the canals and the dam was all mapped. The water tanks on the top, and we, you can see up there the foundations of a retaining wall. So all this intervention on the Black Hill were actually noticed in this early map. And that's all that exists on this amazing site. So I hope that in the near future, something can be done to bring this to um, sort of a better fruition. So there were clearly a lot of monks residing at Caneri. And we know that because in one part of the site, actually, let me go back to the previous slide, right here, okay? So not really in the residential part, but um, on this sort of, um, Side of the, the southern side of the mountain, you have this open gallery with the um, actually votive memorial stupas, okay, all actually built. They're not rock carved. And I don't know if any of you ever went to this part of the site. Probably a few of you did. Now, it apparently, it's very um, difficult. I went many, many years ago with Walter Spink, uh, but uh, that was, you know, several years ago. Um, so it's, it's actually an interesting, um, an interesting configuration here because what you have is a number, these are not rock cut. Um, they are built in, um, you can see here, and uh, they actually, quite, quite a number of them all aligned here, and they were uh, sort of, um, they were clearly, um, built as memorials for illustrious monks who were deceased. We have inscriptions found in there, stone inscriptions, and most of them uh, post-date uh, the fifth century. So they come from the fifth century afterwards. So what we have evidence of is quite a number of advanced monastics defined, as we will see, with different terms like arats or advanced in particular Buddhist knowledge they were actually um, memorialized here, 
and they must have lived at Caneri. So just judging from the number of memorial stupas of advanced practitioners, this site must have been quite a relevant one. Compare it with Baja, for instance, okay, with the early ones. After the fifth century, this site was booming, and educated monks, as kind of referred in the inscriptions, advanced practitioners were residing in these caves. So where were these guys living? They were not living in these type of biharas, the ones that we most commonly associate with Buddhist monasteries. When we think about a monastic residence, we think about a courtyard with cells around. Uh, we don't really think about you know, one room apartments, so to speak, the kind we see at Caneri. So that's kind of an interesting concept. You do not really have this kind of cenobitic monasticism, this kind of living together of the monks, but every monk, or maybe two of them, lived in individually carved caves. Um, which is remarkable, and probably the kind of practices they performed were not really something that you could do in a communal setting. But perhaps what we're looking at here is a site that since the very beginning developed a very strong ascetic propensity. We know that within the Buddhist tradition we have kind of different strands of practice and monastic practices as well. And some monks were devoted to more austere sort of asceticism than others. And I'd like to think that perhaps this configuration of the monastery at Caneri reflects this kind of Buddhism, Buddhist asceticism that we know from the text, but we don't really have documented on the ground. Now, we know that asceticism was practiced in the region. Um, Indraji uh, talks about this Padana Hill not far away from the caves where there are inscriptions, there are padas, and there are all sorts of um, evidence of siddhas living there. Now, we don't necessarily, those were not necessarily Buddhist ascetics, but we do have some inscriptions that make reference to Buddhism at that particular site. So there, were, there was a strong ascetic tradition on these hills. That's what I think, and I do think that this uniqueness of the Canary Caves reflects this sort of domestication of asceticism into a new format, the format of this particular caves. Now, at the time when the Buddhist site starts to be called a Mahavihara, we also, a monumental vihara, a great monastery, we also have, um, we start seeing monumental images as well, maybe worthy of this Mahavihara, of this great vihara. And we are looking at these colossal statues that you know very well, um, and uh, seven meters in height, um, two Buddhas flank flanking the entrance to the Chaitya. Quite impressive and quite unique, frankly speaking, to the tradition of rock cut architecture of the Western Deccan. We do not find such monumental images anywhere in any other caves, really, of this kind of size. Um, the perhaps only comparable one is the Parinirvana at Ajanta, it's five meters. Um, and could be very well linked to this sort of phenomenon of monumentality. But other than that, we do not really find any other example. So this is kind of an odd presence, if you wish, in this, at this particular site. And um, it's, what is interesting is that uh, we really don't know exactly when these images were carved, but an inscription that is incised on a pillar next to the entrance refers anyways to the um, to, to images, an image of the Buddha actually, given by a Shakya Bhikshu, uh, the Mahagandakuti Varika. So this inscription is relevant. Um, I, I find it intriguing that instead of using the, the word Gandakuti, which is what we always find in Buddhist terminology, we are looking at a Mahagandakuti here. You know, it's this Mahavihara that has this Mahagandakuti's perfume chamber that is sort of, um, has the same um, attribute than the Vihara. And whether this is related to the gift of this image, we can't say for sure, but what is also remarkable is again, we have reference of a very advanced teacher here living at the site. Um, and this fits within this tradition of great uh, Buddhist, um, uh, maybe uh, teachers, theologists, or um, monks, educated monks uh, who lived at Caneri. 
Um, and this uh, thing about educated monks is actually something remarkable that we see also in the Buddhist uh, memorial stupas that I referred to before. Arats, who attained the three, three knowledges. We have, they attained the analytical understanding. All sorts of references to this sort of advanced um, accomplishment of the residents of Taneri. So we have a monastic site, a Mahavihara with many caves of a particular kind. They're not about Cenobitic monasticism, isolated sort of an individual units for the practice of these advanced monks who achieved all sorts of spiritual goals and knowledge of the Buddhist tradition. So um, going back to our, um, to our sort of the, the, the presence of these accomplished monks and going back to our um, uh, colossal Buddha, uh, one thing that uh, I was struck is that I couldn't find any reference to this colossi in the area of, um, in the caves of Western Death, and it's like, there is not this tradition of monumentality. And I went to dig for this colossal tradition in the Buddhist world, and the only place I could find quite a lot of evidence for this trend towards monumentality was the northwest of the Indian subcontinent. At the site of Takti Bai, around the fourth century, we have this evidence right at the entrance of the site, just in the same position as you would have at Caneri. So you have at the entrance of the public area of the site, these two colossal Buddhas flanking in the entrance. At Taktibai, same situation. At the entrance of the site, you have this row of colossal Buddhas. I mean, they're not there any longer. You can see the sockets for this stucco images. And these are the faces and the feet, actually quite beautiful. But look at the size of these images. So the face, probably as big as the legs of this gentleman, okay? So we are looking at truly monumental images. These were the sockets for, of course, I think the halo, the heads and all of that. And so this tradition of monumentality uh, really um, explodes, if you wish, with the, which is a bad choice of a word, actually, when we think about the Bamiyan Buddha thing, you know, exploding. Uh, it's it's uh, the uh, very famous um, once, uh, once uh, sort of alive Buddhas of Bamiyan, which really represent the climatic moment of this interest for Buddhist monumentality. So we start seeing this interesting trend of ideas, I think, developed in the Northwest. We saw already connections with Sindh kind of appearing, popping up all of a sudden in this region, in Konkan. And these Northwestern connections are not the only ones. Sindh, I think, was key in this sort of link between the Northwest and the southern regions. And as I went to look, I mean, we don't have much evidence surviving for Buddhism in Sindh, but Sindh was a very strong Buddhist land, I mean, major one. And uh, actually, the work by uh, Johanna van Lois in the Leuve is uh, the only one that survives today with, with sort of a very good uh, survey of the material that we have from Sindh. And if we start looking at the type of iconography and ornamentations of the great stupas Amir Purhas and Kahujo Daro in Singh, we start seeing remarkable connection with the images that we have and the iconography and the um, sort of architectural elements that we find in Western Deccan. So for instance, of course, this is um, sort of this typical um, image of the Badrasana Buddha that we start seeing around the fifth century in many places. And we here have the sort of image from Mirpur Kas right from the museum next door. And um, again, if we look at the very late Chaitya Hola de Lora, we notice that there is an incredible sort of similarity with the ornamental patterns at the Kahujo Daro Stupa in Sindh. So I'd like to think, or to propose, better to say, that there were connections indeed between this northern land and Konkan. They happened via sea. Now we should start thinking about really Canary and Konkan as a meeting ground um, of these different traditions. So when we talk about Buddhism in the fifth century um, and afterwards, and when we talk about connections, the Chinese pilgrims always come in the picture because they are the ones who inform us of what was going on um, in antiquity. They are some of the main sources of information, especially when it comes to Mahaviharas. They talk a lot about the Mahaviharas of North India but they don't talk about the Buddhist caves of Western Deccan, or at least they talk just a little bit, perhaps just enough uh, for <laughs> what we need. 
So the first one, Fa Xian in the fifth century, he talks about, I mean, first of all, Fa Xian, those guys talk about Western Deccan as a very wild area. I mean, it's like, you know, animals, brigands. I mean, it's a place that they, they never visited. And so I think a lot of the information they get is secondhand information. Uh, while well, they surely visited the great viharas of, of North India. Um, and uh, so Fashian talks about a rock cut pigeon monastery, which who knows what you know he's referring to. But what is interesting is that in his description of the pigeon monastery, he kind of describes a site that looks like Canary. So whether that is whether he actually heard descriptions of Canary secondhand and talking about this. Um, cave temples, he, he actually inserted that information. We really don't know. But look at this. He talks about this site, the Pigeon Monastery, as having many small monastic cells. So we're not looking at the big viharas. He doesn't talk about big viharas. He talks about rock cut stairs cutting across the hill, which is one of the amazing features of Canary, actually, because to go to all these sites, you have still these original stairs. It's kind of amazing. And he talks about water twirling and flowing in a stream in front of the caves. I mean, I thought, no, this is impossible. And he talks about many harats living in the monastery. So when we go back and think about, again, our memorial stupas with evidence, actually, of harats recorded there, it's, it's quite interesting. Now, Shenzang in the seventh century echoes the descriptions of Fa Xian. So I wonder whether he actually takes Fashian's description and kind of adds information onto it. And he speaks of a monastery called Brahmaragiri. So we are getting close to Krishna. It's a mountain, OK? Um, and that was cut in a solid mass of rock without approaches or intervening valleys, which is interesting because this is actually the landscape of Krishnagiri. If you think about Ajanta, if you think even about I don't know, Elora, they're all cut on a cliff. You have the ravine, you have the waterfall. There is kind of almost a standard configuration. Canary is a little bit different. It's sort of really crowning this Black Hill in a different way than these other sites of Western Deck and later sites, like 5th century, where were situated, or Elora, 7th century. So the monastery whose foundation is associated to a Satavahana king, which Makes sense. When I think of Sadhavahana King, I think about Shailendra somehow. <laughs> and so I turn towards this the Sadhavahana King in the room. And, and then to is also tight, which is much more problematic and difficult here to, to the Buddhist thinker Nagarjuna. And that's a whole another story which I'm not gonna touch here. We leave it like that. Uh, but let's look at the physical description of the site. He says it's included elaborate rock cut works, viharas on five levels. So this is the thing that actually prompted scholars to think that perhaps Xuanzang was talking about the Lora with the multi-storied um, caves. However, if we count all the kind of alignment of the caves at Canary, we see that they are really aligned on five levels. So it's interesting. Maybe he was not thinking about the multi-storied cave. Maybe in this description, we are looking at the sort of rows of cells that were carved on the mountain, complex waterworks. So this is very interesting because we don't have this very complex waterworks. If you think, yes, you have water tanks at the Janta, but uh, think about Canary. I mean, it's like all this incredible intervention in the sort of hydrography of the, of the area. A huge monastery, again, so Mahavihara really, occupied by over a thousand monks and had a major library with all the author authoritative works of instruction spoken by Shakya Buddha and all the explanatory compilations of the Bodhisattvas and the ex exceptional collection of the miscellaneous schools. So he goes on and on about the library. If we think about the Mahavihara as an educational center, the library was a key element for a great monastery. A great monastery without a great library wouldn't go. And the only problem with this description is that Xuanzang positions this site 300 li southwest of the Kosala country. But that's another story that I can't, it's another can of worms that I can't open here. But I think that's not too bad. I mean, it's a problem, but maybe not too terrible. We can solve maybe that puzzle. So finally, we get to the ninth century, and we have 
evidence of the Mahavihara becoming a Sri Krishna Giri Maharaja Mahavihara. So this is how it's defined in an inscription from the KV11 dating to the ninth century. So we are looking quite at a prestigious site. We're just not, not an ordinary Mahavihara. I mean, this is all these sort of honorific titles that are given to the Mahavihara Kaneri. And frankly speaking, they are actually the titles that we see actually documented at Nalanda. I mean, we're talking about the great major centers of Buddhism in North India. So uh, that's uh, quite remarkable. And um, so this, this Sri Krishna Raja, uh, Sri Krishna Giri Maharaja Mahavihara is how the monastery is um, um, indicated uh, or, or labeled in this inscription uh, that commemorates the donation by someone coming from the Gauda country or Bengal. So the next level of inscription is someone coming again from very far away. This time from the heart of Buddhism, Pala Buddhism in, the, in Bengal. What is also remarkable is someone here gives a lot of money for the construction of meditation rooms and, of course, clothing for the monks at this particular vihara. So this title, Sri Krishna Giri Maharaja Mahavihara, as I said before, is something that really echoes what we kind of see in the um, epithet of the Nalanda Monastery, which was the Buddhist monastery par excellence with a great number, the Mahavihara. But whenever we, we say Mahavihara, we think about, I think it's an immediate association, Mahavihara Nalanda. And um, so we are looking at this kind of, of uh, evidence and at this kind of monastic presence and occupation and Nalanda. So we are looking at one of the great centers for the Buddhist tradition. And then we see Kaneri, the Sri Krishnagiri Maharaja Mahavihara. So we are looking at something that at least in the Buddhist world at the time was perceived as equal, if you know, not like a good competition perhaps for the monastery of North India. Um, what kind of evidence do we have then of sort of material presences, just not looking occupation by monks and devotees at Kaneri? Well, only, the only uh, material was that was harvested, harvested, collected at the site was documented by West in the 19th century. And West talks about these um, incredible votive plaques Quite a number of them found at Caneri. I'm not sure where they are kept now and, and if they are still around or they're lost, I'm not sure. But what is interesting in this drawing of, the, uh, of this uh, votive plaque, you will notice that we are looking at an identical image of a votive plaque from the 9th century site of Bodhgaya. So it's like we have, you know, the uh, sort of the the classic formula with the Ye Dharma incised. And so we are looking at this type of images that really connect the Mahavihara of Kaneri to the northern great monasteries of the uh, Gangetic Valley. Um, so positioning this cave site right next to the great centers for Buddhism at the time. And we have more material from uh, Kaneri that was collected um, so by West, quite a number of these sort of clay impressions that uh, you, this is not from Caneri, but this I used just to show how this sort of clay impressions were positioned as relics at the very center of these clay votive stupas. So quite a number of them, uh, West, uh, significant number, I can't remember exactly how many, but he reports finding them. And he reports finds also of this dried clay stupas, okay? That look quite different from the one we see from Bodhgaya this time. Um, it's a very interesting kind of uh, type of stupa with four stairs uh, in the cardinal directions. Um, and remarkably, these kind of stupas are not found very much in, the, in Bihar. They are not, but you find them quite a lot in the Northwest, in Gandhara and Afghanistan. I mean, tons of this actually from the uh, very late excavations here that we have in the area of Ghazni, um, also at the site of Tepesardar, these kind of stairs do exactly like the type we find at Canary, which is not really super common in the, 
in, uh, in this uh, Pala monasteries, um, we find really quite a number of this kind of um, clay stupas. So it's remarkable again to, when we look at the material evidence from Caneri, aside leaving aside the iconography, but just looking and putting together all these evidence of use of the site, we constantly are brought to other regions. We brought, we, you know, we have to look at Sindh, we're looking at the Palawar, the Gangetic Plain, uh, again, back to the Northwest. So it's, it's a far-reaching uh, world that we are looking at. And um, then another interesting piece of evidence comes from the, um, from the uh, Canary Cave 12. Um, that again is mentions to Shilahara princes and the, the Rashtrakuta king in power. And this inscription is actually in the cave that is right across the water from um, Cave 11. And it commemorates the gift of 20 uh, dramas for the worship of the Buddha, three for repairs in the Vihara, and five for books, plus a perpetual endowment. Um, so what I actually find interesting in this description, now we are finally um, seeing the donation for books, okay, which is something that we don't, when we look at inscriptions in cave temples, we hardly find books mentioned. I mean, it's water tanks and caves and uh, repairs, uh, images, um, but books, no. And if we notice, this guy gives more money for books than for repairs in the Vihara, okay? So that is quite remarkable. Must have been a library um, right there. And um, it's indeed something that uh, it's worth exploring. Um, so when we think about library, we have to think about, so where was this library? What was going on at Caneri? Was there a monastic center for the study, for education, for copying the manuscript. That is a part, a key part of a monastic activity, especially if we're looking at the Mahavihara. The Mahavihara is a center, for, it's the hub for knowledge. So um, I think that Cave 11, the so-called Darbar Hall, was probably the place where it was probably the, the hole where the manuscript were copied and even, who knows, in those rooms kept. Maybe not a refectory, not a place for monks to eat or, or doing this kind of activity, but something that actually happened. This is how Himalayan monasteries look today. So perhaps we have to imagine this stone bench covered with mats of carpet and this kind of activity going on, you know, with this alignment. And one thing that really I find interesting is that there is a lot of light in this cave. Think about it. If you are actually copying the manuscript, you're not in a dark cave. And this cave has a lot of light in it. So, I mean, this is a slide taken with no, you know, actually, it's not a slide, it's a photo from my phone even. So, it's, um, it's something that is interesting and perhaps an indication of the kind of activity that went on and also the configuration of the site with all these rooms also on the side. Perhaps we are looking really at the library. Now, this kind of plan is not unknown in the Western Deccan. We have another example in Laura K5. And I do think that both Caneri and Ellora are really the stronghold of late Buddhism in the region. Um, so um, then what other, um, so if, if there were so many monks living here, if this was a Mahavihara, if indeed activities of copying text was going on, then, um, do we have other information about this Mahavihara? So right now we have been looking at evidence from Caneri about Caneri. Does anyone else talk about Caneri? And yes, they do. So I started looking all of a sudden at references to the Krishnagiri Mahavihara, okay, in other sources around. And um, does anyone actually mention this Mahavihara? And all of a sudden, I was talking to a colleague who reads Tibetan, and realized, well, I first found some evidence and then I had the opportunity to talk to her, that there is quite a number of biographies of uh, tantric masters of, uh, that talk about Krishnagiri. So perhaps what we're looking at is a site that after the ninth century became an important site for esoteric practices. And to the point that for instance, Yampada, the founder of one of the exegetical schools of the Guhya Samaja Tantra, apparently in his biography, is said that prior to, be, to become a teacher of Vikramashila, which is one of the great Viharas of North India, 
He received training at Kaneri for Krishna Giri, I should have said, I should have written, for nine years. So he was dispatched here to learn Tantra. And he, here is the um, actually biography by, translated by Davidson. Um, and uh, there, there is some contention about this translation. Uh, another scholar, Peter Shanto, uh, has also proposed an alternative reading, which I will mention then later. But the gist of the story is that Krishnagiri is there. Um, and uh, it gives kind of a strange etymology about Krishnagiri, this place with its twisted trees. We'll go back to that. But look at this. I mean, it talks about... Uh, all this sort of siddhas who live at uh, Krishnagiri and have these miraculous powers and uh, talks about actually um, all these um, donations that we have, okay? At uh, Krishnagiri, we have gold pearls and all sorts of uh, support and wealth here. And uh, Buddha Gyampada was here to get training and he... Um, so got all this sort of knowledge, advanced knowledge, and then he left. He left and went to Vikramashila, where he became one of the key abbots there. And frankly speaking, oops, sorry, the Pala world was not so that far away, so to speak, from the Rashtrakuta world. And uh, in fact, we know that um, at this point in time, precisely when we have this sort of evidence of, of um, inscriptional evidence at Caneri, we do have a lot of sort of contention between these three major players um, in India. Uh, and we have to envision that a certain degree of exchange, I think there was between the great monasteries of the Pala world and, and Caneri. So uh, it's interesting, Caneri seems to have been the ascetic place also at the time where actually these guys you need to learn to become a Siddha, you need to get training, go to Kaneri. So it was a particular kind, I think, of Mahavihara with a great ascetic resonance. Now, um, when we start looking at the uh, kind of images, we also continue to see sort of uh, types that we find in the Pala world. For instance, we were talking about this image early on, and um, these type of, of figures, of course, have become very common, quite commonly found in Bihar in the ninth century, images of Tara. And um, so what I think also, I would like to bring you to your attention to the fact that a lot of the um, uh, ritual objects in a tantric, in an esoteric practice are not necessarily big sculptures on the wall. So we're talking about tanka paintings on cloth. We're talking about ritual implements, wooden images. So all sorts of things that wouldn't leave trace in the kind of monumental uh, sort of remains of the monastery. Um, and so the fact that we do not have a lot of tantric imagery at Caneri does not, I think, have to uh, sort of dissuade us from thinking that tantra may have been practiced there. Uh, so these kind of iconographies are well established at the time in Elora, for instance, and you see also images of Vasudara, which was mentioned uh, in the um, pre previous source. Um, we have, all in all, in the region, uh, a very active Buddhist scene around the 8th century and 9th century. So again, Kaneri is not the odd thing out. We are looking at a lot of Buddhist activities. And the uh, enshrinement at Sopara of these bronzes uh, in the reliquary of the stupa speaks that there is so, such a strong interest in patronage that the stupa get reopened, reconsecrated, because whenever you add something to the stupa, you reconsecrate it. So these, there was enough sort of mass and energy and force within the Buddhist tradition of the region to go reopen this massive stupa and reconsecrate it. Um, so what is interesting is that this kind of dialogue with the northern tradition of Buddhism is also, I think, present in the material from Sopara. For instance, if we start looking, even though the Sopara images, I think are very, I actually think they're local. I don't think they come from anywhere else. I don't know, but this is my impression. What I see is that there is sort of this part of this visual lexicon that develops um, at the time, around the sort of eighth, ninth century, ninth century, I guess, uh, when we talk about Pala art, but uh, 
maybe the bronzes at Sopara slightly earlier, but regardless, I think there is this sort of um, dialogue with northern forms. Um, I mean, let's look, for instance, at the Asada image of a Buddha, um, and also the, this kind of placement of the Buddhas in this particular um, configuration all speaks of, of sort of connection with this uh, tradition. And then, um, as we continue to kind of move through times, we find again another interesting reference to the um, um, Chinese uh, pilgrim, the uh, Chinese pilgrim, the famous uh, Buddhist master Atisha, which we see represented here in a tanka from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, who apparently himself supposedly came to Krishnagiri to receive training. Now, this is an interesting thing because Atisha is the sort of teacher par excellence, um, tantric teacher by, by ex par excellence, who was. Well, of course, a lot of that is a legendary stories, but what is interesting is that whether Atisha came to Kaneri or not, it's irrelevant. The fact that Krishnagiri is in his biography, I think it's relevant. Same from Buddha Gyampada. If, uh, if he was there or not, well, that's great. But the fact that in order to kind of establish a lineage of training, you say, oh, he went to Krishnagiri. It's like, oh, he went to Oxford or he went to Harvard. Now, whether he went or not, it's not important. But the fact that he used that institution to prove how these great masters were well trained, that to me says that Kaneri must have been an important place. So also Atisha, prior to taking his vows, so they all go when they're young. This is interesting. They all go get training in these tantras, in these biographies before getting ordained in this illustrious monasteries, um, he is initiated at Krishnagiri. So they receive tantric initiation at Krishnagiri. And uh, this is, I use the translation that is done by Das in the Chronicle of Buddhism, of the Chronicle of Buddhism in India and Tibet by Bhutan, which is a 14th century text. And uh, so Das translates this passage um, referring to Atisha, who started a study of, um, of the sort of Buddhist, uh, this Buddhist practices at Krishnagiri uh, under a teacher called Rahula Gupta. He took a kind of different name and was initiated to Tantra, essentially. So I'd like to think that perhaps these incredible seats, thrones that are at Kaneri, which I always wondered, you know, what are we doing with those thrones? I love to sit there when I do. I mean, they have a great view if you have ever done it. I mean, they're so tempting, you cannot, um, it just, they encourage you to sit on them. And perhaps, look at that, these are real thrones. They're not just simple seats. They perhaps, we have to imagine some of these great masters perhaps practice all of this or learned or taught or meditated on these thrones. And this is the view that you have. I took this slide while I was sitting there. So actually not exactly, because that's another side. But this is, you, you overlook the hills. And um, I'd like to think that some of these great teachers that taught Atisha, Buddha, Gyampada, and sort of where the masters who sat there and practiced uh, and taught. Perhaps we have to imagine that on these double seats, this double throne, I always wondered, what are those double thrones? They're not bad to take a nap. So perhaps this is what would happen. You would have a master and a teacher kind of sitting and, and I don't know, practicing or learning. I am not sure. But certainly, there are all these interesting, unique features that you find at Canary and you don't find anywhere else at no other sites in the Western Deccan. And then things got even more exciting, at least for me, when I went and looked at other evidence about Krishnagiri. Where else, where else is Krishnagiri mentioned? And uh, in this beautiful manuscript that is well known, of course, it's sex accessible on the, um, it is accessible on the web. Um, it's in the holdings of the Cambridge University Library. It's a copy of the prag of a Pragna Paramita illustrated from Nepal. Uh, we know the name of the scribe. We know the date, 11th century. So it's also an interesting date. This is early one. And um, this book is incredibly interesting because it's different from other copies of the Pragna Paramita. 
because the illustrations are not illustrations of the deity or Buddhist figures, but the illustrations are representation of Buddhist sites that were tantric sites. Buddhist sites, if you see, this is a tantric manuscript, a big Vajra right there, okay? So this circulated in esoteric circles, okay? This was something that was redacted and copied there. And we are looking at sort of, it's almost like a, a photo album of all sorts of sites with great images and great stupas and all of that. And the sites represented include the Northwest, like we have Udhyana, we have uh, Southeast Asia, we have the, of course, I think we have um, all sorts of uh, uh, parts of India. Konkan has the highest concentration of sites documented in this book. It's like, I think there are nine or something. So in all this book that kind of illustrates the main esoteric sites, Konkan gets number one. And not only that, Krishnagiri gets two illustrations, the only site was illustrated twice. So it must have been clearly an important site, whether it's still active at the time, I, um, 11th century, apologies for the <laughs> replication, or you know, whether it was the memory of the site or the site that was alive. I think the site was alive, probably. Um, and look at the representation. First of all, all the illustrations have labels here, okay? So this is the Kadgachaitya, of the site of Krishnagiri in Konkan. Okay, so it's labeled for us. There is no ambiguity. That's it. And what do we see? How is Kaneri represented? You have two monks, okay? One is holding a book, which go back, to, we're going back to the library, sitting in these things, caves, we'll go back to this, black mountain, look at the rocks, okay? And look at the trees here. This is actually quite interesting. Let's go back to the biography of Buddha Gyampada. The trees are such that they are coiled and spreading upwards. I thought, oh, that gives me the shivers when I find this reference represented literally. So clearly must have been some story about Kaneri where the trees were growing this funny way. Um, this is a very unique way of representing a tree. We don't really find that elsewhere in the text. Um, and, well, look at the caves here, okay? This is exactly the kind of profile that we see about the Canary Caves. It's almost like someone took a snapshot, so to speak, of Canary in the 11th century. Um, and, uh, and then you have a stupa in the cave, okay? So what, what are we looking at here? Well, this is, there is no question that this Krishnagiri in this manuscript is indeed Canary, I think. Um, and so um, what about the term Kadga Chaitya that actually um, probably describes this Chaitya, this shrine here represented in the image? So what is a Kadga Chaitya? Well, the term Kadga is, is a term that has a long story in the Buddhist tradition. It refers to a rhinoceros horn or rhinoceros, um, and it refers to individual that pursue enlightenment in solitude and to Pratyeka Buddhas, this sort of individual Buddhas, I mean, the sort of ascetic figures that reach enlightenment in, like alone, okay, in, in isolation in the forest. Um, this term is mostly um, something that is used in, we find well attested in the Mahayana tradition. Um, for instance, there is this famous rhinoceros sutra that is also preserved in Pali and Gandhari, besides Sanskrit, that is a eulogy of forest asceticism. So interestingly enough, the term that labels the Chaitya at Krishnagiri is a term that is attested, attested within Buddhist forest asceticism, where practitioners are encouraged to go and wander like rhinos, which would make perfect sense, I guess, on the Black Mountain at Kaneri. This is all you can do, really. And um, cut ties with the material world, live in solitude, and go to the forest. The forest is really a distinctive element that appears in the practice of Pratika Buddhas and this uh, practice of monastic asceticism. Um, then we have illustration number two from, from the same manuscript, uh, which is this one. This is the, Krishna, the Pratika Buddha Shikara Chaitya at Krishnagiri which is uh, clearly, again, you see these trees with this weird trunk, um, coiled trunks, and then you see monks in the cave, again, this time without a book in their hands. I mean, the book clearly makes reference to the fact that 
Krishnagiri was known as a library, as a training center. And here you have the term Pratyeka Buddha, which we explored before, even in connection with the Kadga Chaitya. The Pratyeka Buddhas are individuals who reside, individual Buddhist monks who reside in a forest or on mountains, and Strong really talks about these Pratyeka Buddhas. Now, the preamble to the Sanskrit version of the Rhinoceros Sutra, which we're back to the rhinoceros here, um, opens with this image of 500 Pratyeka Buddhas assembled in a forest. So the forest is the theme here. It recites in the Gata of the text before entering Nirvana, which is a very suggestive thing. So think about all these accomplished monks. Think about, I mean, it's really something that uh, kind of, if we position within the context of Kaneri, brings to life the site, the monks that lived in there and the kind of practices we did. And um, so we see this connection again. This manuscript was redacted in Nepal, right? So we are talking about way north. Once again, the Krishnagiri Mahavihara, its relevance was quite significant. The, um, there are two images, only site with two images in this book. So the northern connection becomes stronger and stronger, actually, in the later times. The Himalayan connection seems to emerge. And in fact, if we're looking at some of the icons, very distinctive and unique icons from um, Caneri here, uh, you have the, um, this 11-headed Avalokiteshvara that, um, again, is something that you do not find anywhere else in the region. I mean, as far as I know, um, no other presence. This icon is very attested in Northern Buddhism, Himalaya, Himalayan Buddhism. And we have around the, between the 9th and the 11th century, we have quite a number of images of this kind, all in portable, all portable images, so metal images, both in Kashmir, in Nepal, sort of associated, sort of images that circulated, I mean, easily, that would be carried, that would be kind of moving around. And uh, I don't think, you know, it's hard to imagine that one of these images may have come to this region along with monks, along with people receiving training and coming to learn at the Krishnagiri Mahavihara. We don't necessarily have to think about metal images. We could even think about wooden images. We know that wooden images existed, that they were carried, that they were, so it's, it's if we don't want to think about metal, we can think about a material that was actually used, and we know there is a Tara in Buddha Kaneri, so I mean the wooden images were part of the material culture of a Buddhist monastery in antiquity. So I think I should end at this point, because I don't even know how much time I took, because I kept my watch, but I didn't look where I started, so it's, it's kind of bad. So to conclude, I, I mean, I'm still working on this, but I hope that all this sort of pieces of evidence contribute to this like a puzzle trying to figure out the life of the site of the Krishnagiri, of Kaneri and the Krishnagiri Mahavihara in the later phases. And I think this was a key site in the esoteric tradition. I think that in a way we have overlooked this big time. And I think if we dig some more, we may be able to find more references in the northern, in the text from the uh, biographies of other Tibetan or great uh, Siddhas who went and trained at the site. I think the manuscript from Nepal, the Pranyaparamita, is a great attestation of the importance of Kaneri as a center for uh, Buddhist training. And I think there's so much more work to be done that I, you know, this is sort of uh, uh, just a quick overview, a view, as I said, from the um, Krishnagiri Mahavihara. So I invite you to go back there one day and think about all these guys sitting in the caves, think about the library, think about the incredible life of this site that we sometimes tend to miss. So thank you so much for your patience. Thank you. <laughs>